Hello and welcome to the Prospect Blueprint. This webcast is for prospects, coaches, and those who support those prospects so they best understand what it takes to get from one level to another, regardless of what that level is. As usual, my battery mate is Mr. Rick Dempsey, 24-year MLB vet and fan favorite with the Twins, Yankees, Orioles, Brewers, my Cleveland Indians, now I guess the Guardians, the Dodgers, and of course, the 1983 World Series MVP for the Baltimore Orioles. Hi, Rick. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How are you, Rob? Doing well, guys. How's everything going? We have with us Mr. Rob Dutoma. He's the new head coach of the University of San Francisco. He's in the WCC. He's, yes, he is the Don of the Dons. Coach Dutoma comes to USF as the fifth head coach in the program history. After spending three previous seasons at Fairleigh Dickinson University, where he was the head coach of the night since June 2019. These promotions are just flying at him. In uh, 2022, he joined the USF Dons. And let's talk about his background as a coach at Fairleigh Dickinson. The team finished 16-11 in conference play. They were fourth in the Northeast Conference standings. Before that, he was the associate head coach at Fordham. I apologize and helped lead them to their first trip to the NCAA tourney since 1998. I think the Dons have a good one here. He's young, he's energetic, and I I, I think he's ready to rock. Uh, Rick, you're at uh, you're at the plate. Okay, well, you know, like I said, this guy is the guru of recruiting, and I want to know how's it going so far this summer. Are you recruiting, and is it any different from Fairleigh Dickinson, where you came from? I want to see the book that said I was the guru of recruiting. I like that publication, but um, it's been yeah, by, by, yeah, by me <laughs> and Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> it's been uh, it's definitely different um, in the sense of just being in a different region day to day. Um, used to recruit West Coast kids um, a lot for, on the East Coast, but obviously it's different because you have limited times to see them from East to West. Now I can see them on a daily basis. My staff can spend a lot more time getting to know the West Coast player, the West Coast style of play. But uh, recruiting's recruiting. It doesn't matter where you are. A lot of this popped up on my interview process. I mean, how is this East Coast, quote unquote, East Coast person going to make connections, recruit out here, doesn't know anybody, all the things you hear. And all that being said, it's partially true, but recruiting's just relationships and showing people your visions, your goals, what you're going to do for them, their family, their the coach, their program uh, starts with that. And it's relationships and trust. And if you can develop that, I think you get off to a good start. And that's kind of the plan right now. We're in that still in that beginning phase, but we're excited about the direction it's going. What did you uh, prioritize when you were at Fairleigh Dickinson? Which events? Um, you know, was it a perfect game? Was it travel ball tourneys, a college summer leagues? Uh, what, what was your, your basic uh, uh, modus operandi for, for, for finding prospects recruits? Well, in my mind, it really depends what school you're at. Um, everybody's in a different boat as far as recruiting and what needs you have. And actually, I mean, everyone's got similar needs positionally, uh, but it's more what is your niche at your school? What's going to attract kids to your program and how are you going to get them? I mean, anyone goes to a field, we can all go to a field and see the best players, but that's about 5% of what recruiting is. Uh, <laughs> you got to get them to your campus, get them to believe in what you are trying to do and make sure they fit into your culture and you're not wasting time because there's a million events, as you just touched on, going on all the time around the country. Yeah. And if you're just looking for good players, you'll find them. But we got to get players to fill out our roster and help us win games and help us build a team and a culture. So uh, I prior F FDU, I was prioritizing kind of being under the radar because we weren't the most I took over a situation that was not the most ideal, not the most historic not a destination place by anything. Um, so what we were really selling is just our coaching staff, our vision for the future, and coming to be kind of the first wave of guys to do something at a school like that. Um, and to do that, you know, you can't be at the events everyone's at because you're about the last choice anyone wants to go to if anyone else is making them an offer. So we had to get under the radar a little bit and get into kind of people we trusted to tell us a game was going on or 
little shying away from the bigger events. But now a school like this, we're back at some of the bigger events. We actually have two of our assistants right now at the big showcase in um, Arizona at the Junior Fall Classic. So we'll touch on all of them still here. Well, Rob, yeah. you know, the recruiting process right now is pretty wide open. So um, what do you think would be the best system for finding and recruiting talent? Uh, million dollar question. Use your imagination. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think system, I don't know if there is one. I mean, you just, I think a lot of programs and schools, like I said, they go out and they find great players. But uh, as you know, you, you played in the major leagues for a long time. I'm sure you played on a lot of teams with a lot of talent that didn't win as many games as a team with maybe quote unquote less talent on paper, but it was more of a team or more filled gaps that win you ball games rather than look really good in a showcase or running a 60 yard dash or anything like that. So I think you really have to have an internal plan with your staff and what you're looking for, or else you're really just looking at needles in a haystack type of thing. So, you know, you got to know what you're trying to build, what your current team is and what holes you might need to fill to really know what you're looking for or else you're, you're just going to be like running around crazy yeah. at some of these events with, you know, 200, kids playing every day at, at a field or in a complex. I have a question. Oh. Let me jump in real quick, Rick. Yeah, this is something I wanted to touch. Should there be, and, and the NCAA is kind of dropping the ball on a lot of levels. Actually, we're going to have a guy on in about a week or so who wrote a book on how, how the NCAA has dropped the ball for many years now. Should there be regional combines? Um, yeah, I would say, you know, in some of the bigger cities, uh, as opposed to the PGA events, where coaches can gather and get a legitimate look at, let's say, something that lasts three to four days uh, to be able to find talent. I mean, I wouldn't say should or shouldn't. I mean, I think something like that would be helpful. helpful. Uh, I think they've tried. Everyone's tried. You know, Perfect Game has tried. PBR has tried. Um, all the scouts get together and you have the area code games and all the things that happen. I think they – I don't know if it would ever be NCAA sanctioned because they try and keep their hands out of a lot of things and leave it up to individual entities. And that might be part of the issue because yeah. it becomes a money grab and you know, everyone's running their own stuff. We you know, we run camps. We have tournaments. Every other school's doing it. So, I mean, everyone's reaching to get the talent on their facility or close by to where they can see them, but it's not really sanctioned by anything. So, it becomes watered down, overwhelming uh, – yeah, I mean, something – if there was a central base that can say, hey, the best players from here are going to be there at this date, that would be extremely helpful. But, you know, you, you just – you have events where there's a lot of talent, but there's already freshmen and sophomores verbally committed places playing in it, and that becomes useless to yeah. a coaching staff that's looking to find players. But will they be decommitted? Will they be transferring? I mean, it's an entire cycle that – you know, every everyone's trying to get their hands involved in the, the prospects, the players, the the money, every every reason behind it, which makes it very difficult. Robo, I know you're you're really good at recruiting, but how do you personally get players to come to USF? I mean, it's got to be a way that you talk to them and things that you accentuate. How do you get them to do that? Oh, I mean. Like I said before, you have to find what your school, what's valued in your university, um, and what your niche is going to be. Um, we're still kind of figuring that out. It's only been a couple months um, through trial and error. We learn the types of players, student athletes, families that are looking at our university, and what their interest level is, and what's important to them. So we're still formulating that. But when it comes right down to it, I, I mean, I say all the time to recruits when we're walking them around campus or when we have them on the phone and it's getting close to them, you know, narrowing it down, making a decision. I try and reiterate, which I firmly believe to be true that the end of the day, you should be picking your next four year place pretty much for two reasons. Cause th there's two separating factors when it comes down to it. I mean, most schools have great campuses, great fields, great history, and especially in our league. So what's the real separator? It's, do you trust and believe in this coaching staff and their vision? And do you get a good sense around the team that there's a culture being built and teammates that you want to be a part of? Because let's face facts, your guidance counselors in high school, everyone's going to give you that old line of like, if they took baseball away, is this the place you want to be? And 
honestly, that's we all know that's not true. We're all leaving the place. We <laughs> they're all great universities, but we're going to play baseball. You know, that's the reason they're making a lot of their choice. So within that decision, if you're unhappy with the coaching staff and don't believe in them or you don't like your teammates or the culture around the team and the work ethic and whatever, you're not going to be happy no matter how nice the quad is or if it's on the beach or if the weather's nice or you can go to this place on weekends. None of that matters if you're a true athlete at the end of the day because, right. as we all know, 99% of our time is spent with our teammates and coaches <laughs> and the whole college experience that a normal non-athlete student has is not really part of these guys and these female and male athletes' lives, you know, it's your coaches and your teammates. So that's what I try and sell in my whole walks around campus. Yeah, if the players have the right kind of passion for the game, then you, you don't have to worry about that, that part right. of it. You're right. But, but if they know, don't we, like their coaches, if they yeah. don't like their environment, that's, that's <laughs> the number one prevailing thing. And that's what I try yeah. and tell guys uh, on the tours. Let's not be blinded by all the – bells and whistles that a school might have yep. if you don't if you haven't even met the head coach of that program and you're about to say yes that, i think that's a red flag you know <laughs> these are the people that write the lineup at the end of the day so you want to try and develop that relationship and know that this place really wants you to be part of their program you know kel and i have interviewed quite a few college coaches and all of them have a different opinion i'm curious about yours about the showcases that have suddenly sprouted up everywhere over the last couple of years it seems like there's another one every single week do you like the showcases or not as an overall theme yes i mean i like any opportunity to see players play um do i like you know the outside companies the all the things that are going on that kind of get involved uh not all the time but there are some really good companies out there that run great events that are specifically targeted towards it could be gpa it could be uh, location it could be um you know various things that they run camps and you know like hey when i was at fordham those higher academic events nationally were huge showcases for us to be at because we got in the door in in the bay area in la and we knew like hey if they're at this event they already fit all the needs of what you know, a lot of the work's taken out of what we need to do pre-tournament to go see a guy. So I like them, uh, but I don't – I think they're just kind of an introductory because they don't yeah. give you the full ball player and they really don't tell you anything about is this ball person going to be a fit culturally? Do they really want to be part of my university? Um, but yeah. I do advise, like, families, those are good in the beginning because they can get your name on a few schools' radar if you're totally clueless as to – which way you want to go, it could narrow down a list of 100 down to 10. Like, like to, I went to this, these schools reached out, they at least have interest. Let's progress from here. You know, we, we just did a uh, an interview with Royce Clayton, who's uh, the head coach at Oaks Christian. They, they put out a good product over there. You'll definitely want to uh, have that relationship. I'd be happy to hook you up. Uh, he played the bigs for 17 years. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we've played against him. I know that uh, that Rick's career overlapped his by a couple, I think, one or two years. But uh, he was saying that the, you know, the, and the, the focus of that interview was high school versus travel. And he said you really, he believes that a college will get a much better look at a player, uh, feel for him by talking to the high school coach and see how he is, you know, in a team uh, environment. Because, he says kids will cry when they lose a big game in high school. They won't cry in travel ball. And he goes, that's where their passion's at. So with that said, a certain something has uh, reached its nefarious tentacles into our beloved game, uh, which no longer seems like it's a game. That would be the NIL. Um, that would be the transfer portal. Two different items that have got to be on, you know, your the forefront of your mind. Um, how do you approach the portal? Is there really value in this? Uh, how do you determine the value in the portal? And then how is the NIL or the prospects for the NIL having a major impact in recruiting moving forward going to play on, on your strategy moving forward as well? Our NIL is not going away. It's it's here. It's it's um, something we all have to tackle. And, you know, we're not at a university here that, I mean, there's just levels to everything and we can't compete with power five football money schools when it comes to NIL. And we know that. So you can either sit back, make excuses, 
and say it's not fair or you just got to find your way, you know, your way to compete with those those guys. So, um, yeah, it's going to be there. I don't like that it's used in the recruiting process as like a guarantee to somebody that you'll have this if you come here. But what, what am I going to do about it? That's we all know that that's what's going to happen. And at a lot of places that was already going on before it became <laughs> um, legal. And that's why it's here. So um, it's just something like hopefully we're able to educate our our athletes on what it means and how they can benefit. Because I think it's great that if schools are making money off athletes, why can't the athlete make money off themselves? Um, so hopefully our school you know catches up a little bit and put some protocols in place where we can be educated. And if there someone is willing to pay these guys money to do something in the, the city, which we should be able to take advantage of in our location, then great. And I hope we build on it. Um, as far as the transfer portal, uh, we attack it like everybody else. Uh, like you were touching on before with a high school recruit, I love talking to high school coaches because you do. I mean, the last time you see that emotion and that passion and that care is whenever they get knocked out of the high school playoffs, the states, the regionals, whatever it is. So those coaches know more so what it's going to be like, the competition level of caring about winning and losing than maybe their summer programs do. Uh, so that's why I like to see how they – they feel like they would handle adversity and then to turn it into transfer portal. That's what makes it hard because if it's a D you know, D one bounce back recruit that it didn't work somewhere else, who are you calling? You know, like it didn't work with that last coaching staff. So obviously, I mean, we're going to reach out and do our research and you know, it's going to be skewed at least <laughs> if a person's leaving the school and sometimes you get a great record. Hey, our numbers were too many. He's a great kid. He works hard. He just, wasn't going to make it here, um, stuff like that. But other times you're just, you're digging back to maybe three years ago as to, you know, their high school coach from two or three years ago. So it's a little harder to get the background information um, through the portal, but you got to find it. You know, I, I just don't want to blindly recruit a kid and not know anything about his background, but it's both of those things are here to stay. Nothing's changing. You have to figure out, we're all in the learning process of figuring out how to, how to navigate that, both of those two things. Yeah. Rob, when you were talking about the portal and the risk and stuff, and I think, are you more inclined to scan junior college players that are more experienced, maybe a little more talented, the guys that can step right in? Uh, are you more inclined to go after those kind of guys when you're looking for the, the portal to help you? Uh, right now, yes. Um, so uh, I became an assistant coach at the Division Three level in the fall of 2005. So in 17 years of coaching, it wasn't until my second year at, at FDU, which is right after the pandemic, that I truly started looking at junior college as an avenue of recruiting because most of the institutions I worked at, it was you know, Iona, Siena, Fordham. It wasn't really happening. It wasn't big. It was hard to get a junior college transcript approved and accepted. Um, but at FDU, that was our way, you know, and like I said, you got to find your school's niche. Um, we built a pretty good team and I think they'll be good again this year. And a lot of it was through junior college transfers that, and the reason I liked them was they had already had one up one situation that they had to fight their way through. I mean, most junior colleges don't have the best facilities, don't have the best situations. You might have, part-time coaches at a lot of them. Uh, you know, you're navigating, you're fighting, you've dealt with a lot of adversity already. Um, and I knew we were going to have to deal with adversity to get good at my last school. Uh, so like you said, they're, they seem to be more mature, a lot of them. They've been yeah. through a lot. They're just older, you know. <laughs> they're, they're 20, they're 19, 20, 21 already. Um, a lot of kids, at least East Coast, chose junior college, either academic reasons or financially. And you know, not to be stereotypical, but financial background when you had your fight your way to earn something just to get this opportunity at a Division One level three years later. I found that those young men were further along mature level than a lot of the guys we were bringing in out of high school. So um, it's become very prevalent. I love it now. Um, we do have a couple. I was able to add a junior college, a couple junior college guys on this current roster we have right now when I got hired late in the summer. So and we've had a great experience in our couple of weeks practicing with them. I, you know, it just seems like they're more likely to truly appreciate this this opportunity and go get it more so than high school. I feel like it's just like the next logical step to a lot of kids. So they just feel like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. And, and they earn it. 
Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But there's a lot to be said for that person who already had a here. They weren't good enough for this level a couple of years ago. And bang, here you are with this opportunity. I wonder how many kids are stuck in the portal right now, because for a lot of them, it's almost like beaming themselves into space. Their molecules are going to be scrambled and there's no, there's, they're not going to beam aboard any team. So a lot of coaches said, listen, you're not going to get playing time. You know, put yourself in the portal, which means he's not welcome back at that school. And I know at one point there were over, I think there were like 3,000 kids in the portal. Do you have any idea how many are in there now? Uh, yeah, it hasn't changed much. And there's <laughs> it's uh, kind of cycled over into a new year. So that's already started. And they're about to pass these new windows. I mean, you're, you're going to see December 1, when everyone makes their fall roster decisions and has their meetings, there's going to be another big crop of names <laughs> showing up in the portal because we everyone has to get back down to their 35 roster size for next spring. And I it's not too many Division One fall rosters right now with only 35 players on it. So it's yeah. going to be yeah. <laughs> an interesting time. Um, and in December and January, you'll probably see those tweets and everything getting crazy again about the number in the portal. But I don't think it's going away. You know, it's just it, kids are always – you can't fault a kid – you know, as long as coaches are being honest, and I don't know if that's always the case, but uh, if we, were, we we have a couple of kids on our team that were flat out told, like, you'll have the fall to try and show that you're better than people on the team. And people want to take that opportunity, you know, and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that, you know. And But there's – I think it's wrong when coaches don't explain that fully on purpose and leave out some of the gray area so a kid thinks he's on the roster and then he shows up and there's – a lot more people than the roster would allow. <laughs> and that's when the, the portal gets a little crazy, you know, but we'll yeah. have guys that I don't know, we don't, we, we have to get down to our number. So will they choose to go to the portal? Will they choose to stay here, work harder and try again? I mean, can't always fault the coaches on that. It just is what it is sometimes. Well, there's just so many players right now. I, a couple of years ago, I want to say three years ago, uh, there was, I think uh, Santa Barbara Community College, for example, they had 78 kids trying out. There were 78 kids on that roster. I'm trying to think, we were, I guess, with the Cub Scout team, and we played them. And it was shocking to see how many kids were there. And, you know, you'd see some kids who had just graduated from your high school, and they're there trying to make a 78-man, you know, roster. I'm sorry, 70, they were trying to make the roster after it was paired down from 78. And it's, it's like that everywhere, right? So you're going to have 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 kids, most of them nowhere to play. So they are going to probably get on some JUCO rosters. But a lot of these kids, it's it's over. They took that risk and they they failed it, um, unfortunately. it's uh, that, And that might be the, to some extent, that might be the death of the portal. I think, um, you know, when 78, when 85%, 90% of whoever goes into the portal never comes out, that might be a, a self-extinguishing uh, uh, concept, um, which would be interesting and I think, quite frankly, unexpected. Rick, you've got that uh, last question. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, let's talk a little bit about your ball club, Rob. Um, what are you specifically looking for? How many of your good players are are coming back again? I know you want to beef up the win column, and probably you're looking for pitching like everybody at every level. But do you have your eye on anybody specific that's going to really help your ball club? Yeah, I mean, honestly, most times when you take over a program, it's pretty down, you know, pretty down talent wise, pretty down record wise. And if you look, this you know, is a unique situation. They were pretty good last year, you know, hung around 500, made the conference tournament. Uh, we did lose a few guys off that roster like everyone does every year. So, um yeah, I mean, there's some holes we got to fill, but luckily, I think we did a good job scrambling late to get some needs filled. Um, and as we build and progress, I think years future, you know, obviously, it'll it'll work it'll work into the culture it needs to be. But we're getting there. Um, I do think we have a few pitchers that can help us right away, and uh, we just started inner squads this week, so it's been fun to see some competition um, amongst each other. Uh, there's Two freshmen that took them out yesterday, and they looked extremely talented. Uh, and that's right. You know, if you can build around those guys, you got a couple years to build around those guys. It was one inning. It was an inner squad. I don't want to go crazy, but, I mean, it was they're, they've looked good in their progression. Um, and we're real excited, you know. I mean, Adam Shoes back. He played a major role 
for them last year coming out of the pen, starting. He started the playoff game. Um, he looks good. So we'll see. I mean, I wouldn't – I don't know. It's it's a day-by-day process to see if you're good enough. But I do – I'm encouraged by what we have um, compared to what I had to take over as a head coach at my last job. Um, we're, we're light years ahead talent-wise. Um, I think it's just a matter of everyone adjusting – attitude, culture, nothing wrong with how things were going on in the past. But anytime you bring a whole new coaching staff in and it's 22 years of somebody else before you, there's obviously some stuff that's going to be done differently. Uh, not not <laughs> yeah, better, so. <laughs> not, better so. not worse, but different. And <laughs> these players, they got to, they're adjusting, you know, yeah, and they've yeah. done a really good job adjusting to us as a coaching staff. Yeah. Rob, do you need a catcher? Because I mean, I know I'm a little bit older than most of your college kids or most of your coaches, but hey, I can come in with your closer and give you one good inning and that's it and close out these games for you. Yeah, who who doesn't need catchers? I mean, of course we need a catcher. You're just, you're just trying to play one more decade in the major leagues, keep t- tacking on. <laughs> Five decades. He's he's oh. been he was in the majors as a catcher longer than any catcher in the history of the game, which is a record. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And then I'm amazed really you so played many World Series MVPs, right? So he's part of that too. I can't believe how old I'm getting that it's you played with Royce Clayton because I feel like Royce Clayton was in the league yesterday. I can't believe how, yeah. how old we're all getting. Wow. I know, isn't that crazy? I'll, by the way, I'll hook you up with him. I'll send you a little invite. He's a good guy. You'll want to know him. Great. Um, absolutely. I'll take care of that afterwards. And I've got to send you a pizza, folks. If you don't know, we already did an interview with Rob and I forgot to click record. And that is just the reality of it. So we're, yeah, I know. Rick's eyes bugged out of his head and said, that was amazing. <laughs> Son of a gun. I forgot. To well, we got an opportunity to talk to him again. Finally. You know, and I enjoy that because yeah. I don't think I've ever met so many passionate coaches, managers, whatever you want to call them at your level, than I have in college baseball. It has been incredible. And I want to thank you again, Rob, for coming with us because it's a lot of fun to talk to you guys. It gets me energized about the game. Oh, it's fun for me too. I appreciate you guys having me uh, twice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rob, you you got to send me your uh, address. <laughs> I'm going to get you out a big pepperoni. From all of us here at the Prospect Blueprint, I want to thank Mr. Rob Detoma, the head coach of the University of San Francisco Dons. He is the Don of the Dons for joining us. Rick, as usual, have a great afternoon yourself, my friend, and I'm sure you'll probably be out on the links tomorrow. So, uh, you know, you've got to maintain that suntan. Meanwhile, from all of us at the Prospect Blueprint, keep your chin in and your eyes on the ball. We'll see you soon. <laughs>